and his grace. Mm. Amen. Unmerited favor. Praise your name, Jesus. We love you, Lord.
my heart belongs to you. My heart belongs to you. Oh, yes, it does. My heart belongs to you. I'll never give. I'll never give myself to another. Because my heart belongs to you. My heart belongs to you. My heart belongs to you. Is that the truth about yourself? Oh, does your heart belong to God tonight? Oh, y'all give him a hand clap of praise. Yeah. Glory to you, Jesus. I just felt Jesus, I just felt God so strong a moment ago. She told me to come up, I told her no. I just felt like God was stirred. I just well, I wanted to sing the song, but I couldn't think of the name of it. Okay. <laughs> My heart belongs to God. You know, many, many years ago, I made that choice. I gave my heart to God. Now, there's been a lot of battles, a lot of war, a lot of change in those years. But the one thing I've made sure of is I've always let Him keep my heart. There's been some times when I've fallen, but I was able to find my way home because my heart belonged to Him. And it's Yahweh, wait, keep your, keep your commitment to Christ. And there's nothing you won't be able to handle. Amen. Give him one more hand clap of praise before you're seated. Yes. Glory to you, God. Amen and amen. Y'all may be seated. Hebrews 11.8. We're going to minister tonight on the subject of keeping your eyes on the prize. I believe that so often we lose focus of, of what God wants us to be and we lose focus of why we should stay in the race. There are so many reasons that we can come up with why we quit, right? It's just tough. You know, to be a Christian in this world, you take persecution, people don't want to hear it anyway. And the more you tell people about God, the, the more they want to put you down and, and, and try to tell you, you know, you, you do something. Oh, I thought you were supposed to be a Christian. You know, then you want to punch them in the face and prove that you're not one. <laughs> you know, you don't do it, but, but it's a struggle. We, we go through that. But there are so many distractions that will get your eyes off of the prize. There's so many things that will cause you to wander away from the path that God has for you. The devil is an expert manipulator. He knows exactly what to come at you with to cause your eyes to move. Doesn't he? You know, it's in those moments that you're prepared for the devil. He can't, he can't make you flinch, can he? But it's in those moments that we're not prepared. And we begin to take our eyes off of the prize. We take our eyes off of the calling. We forget just exactly what it is that we're in this about. And, it, and it, that's a dangerous place for the church to be. It's dangerous for the church to lose focus of what we're called for. We preached this morning on the lost coin about the coin was intended to circulate in order to have its purpose fulfilled. And the church, in turn, was created to circulate, to bring the message of Jesus Christ to a lost and dying world. But I believe that if we can get a hold to the promise of God, that we can see something beyond ourselves. Hebrews 11.8 says, By faith, Abraham, when he was called to go out into a place which he should after receive for an inheritance, obeyed. And he went out not knowing whether he went. By faith he sojourned in the land of promise as a strange 
as in a strange country, dwelling in tabernacles with Isaac and Jacob, the heirs with him of the same promise. For he looked for a city which had a foundation, who builder and maker is God. Father, I ask that you would be with me and allow me to speak the word that you have given me. Touch the heart of the hearer. Lord God, let them hear your voice tonight as you draw them into those places. I ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. As I, as I read that last verse, he looked for a city whose builder and maker is God. How many of y'all have ever looked at the, uh, the tags in the back of your clothes? It tells you, it says, made in Japan, made in America, made where? See, and, and I believe that so often the church is settling for stuff made on earth rather than stuff made in heaven. See, I believe that we can have a, a journey that we can hold on to, that I can determine that what I'm going to have in my life has its foundations in heaven and not in earth. See, I believe that God wants us to have faith in something that is eternal and not something that's temporary. The reason we are able to hold on through the battle is because our faith is not in this world, but in the world to come. That is the hope that we have. It is the hope of, of, of salvation, the hope of peace, the hope of victory. It's not what I see by the flesh, but it's by what I inherit through the Spirit of God. This is the, the process. Abraham sojourned in this world, gave up everything that he knew, walked away from his family, walked away from his inheritances, walked away from all the things that he knew for a fact, and he looked for a city whose builder was God. He didn't want an earthly kingdom, amen? He wasn't looking for an earthly city. He wasn't looking for something that, that had a foundation in this world. He wanted something supernatural, something eternal. Now we see that Lot, his, his uh, nephew who followed him along, one of, so there's some interesting things about Lot if, you, if you've never studied him out. One of the interesting things about Lot, Ken, is he never built an altar. You look in the Bible, he always went off of his uncle's faith. He never developed for himself. I found that so interesting. I didn't notice that, but I noticed that in the Word of God. I noticed that Lot never built an altar. He never had a personal experience or, or a personal uh, investment in the kingdom and personal investment in his relationship with God. He just going off other people's stuff. I did that for years. I went off my mom and my dad's uh, vision, their heart, their everything. I never went to the place where I began to develop for myself. I was looking for things that would satisfy me in this world, Brother James, not the things in the world to come. I just wanted stuff that was going to get me through. And I didn't worry about the other side. So, so my focus wasn't necessarily in the things of God as they were in the, in the things of the world. I wanted a good city. I wanted a good future. But I was looking for one here. I was looking for the stuff that, that is man-made, a man-made success. What man considers to be the, the pinnacle of our success is not necessarily what God would determine is the place he wants us to be. Abraham looked for a city whose builder and maker was God, but Lot abandoned Abraham and went to Sodom and Gomorrah. He went to the worst cities on the face of the earth, full of perversion, Sodomites. He went there to that city, found himself as he pitched his tent towards Sodom. He finds himself in a couple of chapters living in Sodom and Gomorrah, sitting on the gate in leadership. He even goes into bondage because he made a choice to live there. His uncle Abraham came and found him in the, in the pits and drew him out of that, defeated the kings that had overcome the king of Sodom and Gomorrah, drew them back, gave them back their freedom. And what did they choose to do? They chose to stay in Sodom because they sought an earthly uh, kingdom. A lot was satisfied with just having a place in this world, just having a position in this world. He was satisfied with the status quo of the world around him. And Sodom was a great city. It was a huge twin city, Sodom and Gomorrah. They were, they were the talk of all the, the plains. Everybody came there to do all of their trading. That's where all of the, the mighty people live. And they lost everything. Lot lost everything because the foundations of that city were based on the things of this world, not the things of God. 
We got to stop putting our eyes on the things of this world and we got to begin to look outside of that. When I came to salvation, I came to faith. I, I remember just like it was yesterday when I surrendered my life to God, I determined that I would be anything and do anything. All that God wanted me to do, I was ready to do. I was ready to abandon everything in this world. I didn't care. All of my plans, I gave them to God. My plans were to be rich. That was my plan. I wanted to have money. I was willing to invest in the church. I really was. And I would have too. I would have invested back in the church. I would have taken my money and I'd have helped missionaries and I'd have, I'd have done all the different kinds of things because that's in my heart to do. But my plans were not to be a preacher. Preachers equal poverty. Where I come from anyway, you know. If you, my daddy was a pastor and he didn't have nothing. All the little churches in our community, all the pastors were poor. I didn't want to be poor. I wanted to make all of them have a better life. I was going to give more money to the church. That was my plan. My plan was to make money and be happy. And God called me into ministry and said, you can't be happy unless you're obedient. And I, stood, I looked around me and I did. I, I weighed out. The things that I knew I could do with my own strength and my own power. And I knew I was set up in a position to be able to move forward to make money. I was in a place that the position that I was going to have was going to elevate me to more money and, a, and, and put me in a springboard position that I would be able to, to then move up in the company quicker because I would be known and seen and everybody already liked me and, and God saved me. And here I stood in that place. Should I take the money or what's behind box number two, right? Let's make a deal. And that's what the devil tried to do. He wanted me to make a deal. He wanted me to look just like he did for Jesus. What did he do? He said, look, if you'll bow down to me, I'll give you all of this stuff. And Jesus said, thou shalt have no other gods besides the one God. He said, well, I'll make you powerful. People will look at you and they'll say, wow, there's something about it. just jump off the pinnacle. You know, the angels are going to catch you and everybody's going to see that you're one of God's people. He said, you're not going to tempt the Lord your God. And he said, well, look, fulfill your own lustful desires first, then deal with people. Turn the stones into bread. He said, you're not going to live by bread alone, by every word that comes out of the mouth of God, devil. You see, Jesus refused to make a deal with the devil, but so often I think we forget just what it is God called us to. Now, God didn't call us to poverty, but he called us to trust. If God hadn't called me to preach, I was in a perfect place with the favor of God to move on in the world and to make money and to have position as long as my heart would have been what God wanted it to be. He doesn't mind you having money. People misquote that scripture all the time that, the, that money is the root of all evil. No, it's not. The love of money is the root of all evil. Money is a tool. Can I tell you without money, our missionaries will never accomplish what they need to do. Without money, we'll never be able to reach the world with the gospel of Jesus Christ. Money, it's okay to have money, just don't let money have you. Right? And so there, Abraham, who was getting wealthier and wealthier, went into, into uh, to Egypt, and he could have had a lot. Man, he could have had anything he wanted. He was very powerful. He, the, the king of the, the Philistines were, were really afraid of him because they were afraid of how strong he had become. He sent out with his men and a few others, and they completely beat up five kingdoms. That's pretty bad. And he could, he could have made his own kingdom in this world. He could have had the, the, the kingdom of Abraham. I mean, he had the power, he had the ability, but he wasn't looking for an earthly kingdom. He was looking for a heavenly kingdom. He was looking for a city that God had built because he believed God had called him out of his world into a new world. And what is it that we're looking for? Are we looking for something in this world? Or are we trying to find what God has for us? Are you, are you keeping your eyes on the prize of what God has called you to do? Are you looking for something human made or are you looking for something God made? You see, anything that is human made and earthly is going to have an expiration date on it. Everything in this world is going to come to an end. Do y'all know that? 
This whole world is going to be burned up and done away with and there's going to be a new heaven and a new earth. You can guarantee that just as sure as anything else. The ozone is going to be gone one day. All of our resources are going to be gone one day. One day this whole thing is going to be burned up. But it's not the end of it. God's going to create a new one. In all of its glory for us to live in for eternity. I'm not looking for something on earth. Things here are temporary. They're not going to last very long. In James, the fourth chapter, the 13th verse says, Go to now ye that say, Today or tomorrow we will go into such a city and continue there a year and buy and sell and get game. Whereas you know not what shall be on the morrow. For what is your life? It is even a vapor that appears for a little time, then vanishes away. For thou ought to say, if the Lord wills, we shall live and do this or that. So James wants us to understand that our life here is temporary. Now, you don't know how temporary this life is when you're young. You know, when you get to be like Charles, you know, time starts clicking away pretty quick. Brother Arthur Bluehead told me what the, that one day was in where I'd do our visitation, and he said, Pastor, life is like a roll of toilet paper. Now, that can go a lot of ways, y'all. <laughs> and so I said, What do you mean? He said, The closer to the end of the roll you get, the faster it goes. Now, at 89 years old, I believe he got a better grasp of that than I do. But isn't it true? How many of y'all can believe we're at December the 1st? 2019. Next, I mean, next year's almost on this. 2020. We'll have greater vision in 2020, won't we? <laughs> Whatever. <clears throat> Someone asked on, on Facebook, are you going to have, uh, you're going to start the year off with a series on vision? And I just put, I don't see it. the obvious things right but but here we see james is saying to the church y'all need to stop determining that you're in control of who you are how many y'all know you've been bought with a price you don't belong to you no more you belong to god jesus paid for you he bought your way out of sin and he expects you to follow him where he's going he expects you to say god if it's your will for me to do this i'll do this it's not just good stuff or bad stuff he's talking about it's everything we determine to do as as christians should be based on the fact does this what god wants me to do or not is this the direction God wants me to go? Well, I'm going to go. I'm going to spend five years doing this. And after that, I'm going to do this. No, you don't know what you're going to do. I don't know from today to tomorrow what God's going to do in my life. How are you going to plan 10 years of what God's going to do in your life? You can't do that. You can't determine. I'm going to wait till I, I've achieved this in my world. I'm going to go and make this much money. Once I've made this much money, I'm going to surrender my life to serve God. You can't do that. How many of y'all know you're not guaranteed a tomorrow? We're not guaranteed that God's going to allow us to live out those plans. What we need to be doing is, God, you open the doors and I'll walk through them. God, if you want me to do this, I'll do it. And God, when you tell me to stop, I'll stop. God, I'm not going to take one order and make my whole life out of that. I'm not going to listen to one word that comes from God and close the door so he can't speak to me anymore. But I'm going to allow God to speak to me over and over and over. I'm going to let God guide me every step of the way when I'm not sure about about what tomorrow holds i'm going to hold on to the one that holds on to tomorrow i'm going to trust that god sees where i need to be and i'm going to trust that he's going to take care of me and what i'm believing god for is not something temporary that's made on earth i'm looking for something eternal that's made in heaven amen i'm believing for god i'm believing for the blessings i'm believing for the direction and i i have determined that i know that i am a temporary pilgrim right i'm just passing through this old world like abraham said I, i'm not looking to plant roots down here i'm looking for that city that's eternal i'm looking for that city that that god himself has built because he wants us to enter into that place and so when i make my plans i make my plans to get to that city how many of y'all know what I mean? I mean, there are times when what you think is best for you is not what God says. 
There are times when, when shortcuts to success seem to be the way to go. But there are the way that leads further away from God, not towards God. Because we have our eyes on things in this world, we lose focus of just what it is God has for us, and we somehow we, we replace God's success with humanity's success, and we think that if we get bigger numbers in bigger places that we've succeeded with what God wants, while there are people who are on skid row that are praying for one person at a time, they don't have a building to preach in, they don't have finances to write checks out of, but they're down there leading men and women to Christ one at a time. Can I tell you, if that's what God has called them to, there is a mansion waiting on them in heaven, and you cannot be anything better than God's going to build. It, the success of being what God wants you to be is being what God wants you to be. That is success. The only measurable tool for God's success is being and doing what you know God told you to be and do. I, I've shared many times when I came to Bayou Blue years and years ago, almost 27, I was told I would not be happy here. That Bayou Blue was a small church because it wanted to be a small church. And I said, I don't know. You know, it didn't make me any difference, Brother Tommy. I didn't care how big the church was. It, it didn't matter to me. I was where God told me to be. And now all those people who said Bayou Blue was small, wanted to be small, and I wouldn't be happy here, wish I'd leave so they could try to come. <laughs> but I won't. Because this is where God called me. I had people say, well, you, know, you, ought, you ought to leave your name in for this or that. I said, no, I'm not going to do it. I'm pastor by your blue symbol of God. That's what I am. That's what God called me to be. And whether the church grows or stops growing, whether the church achieves any great thing for this world to recognize or not, doesn't matter. I'm where God wants me to be, doing what God called me to do. And therefore, I'm successful in that. If you're where God called you to be right now, you're in church here, you're called to be here, you're doing what God told you to do here, you are successful in the kingdom of God. And you got to keep your eyes on that. You know what? God moves other people. God raises up and moves out. We have a whole school of leadership in, in the School of Urban Missions that we're raising up leaders to, to take churches to be apostles and evangelists, pastors, teachers, prophets. We're, we're raising up an entire generation to send them out. And that's what we hope to do is plant them in churches, plant churches with them, do whatever God wants us to do. But, but we're not right. You know, I don't raise up a church so that it, I can have more people. People, I want to impact the kingdoms of this world. I want this church to be a, a threat to the kingdom of hell. That's what I want. I want our ministry to, to break down the strongholds that hell has built in our community. And I want us to advance the kingdom of God. The only way to do that is to keep our eyes on God. Because it doesn't look like we're making much of a dent. When you look around us and we see the things that are out there, it looks like we kind of on the wrong side. It looks like they're just growing more and more. But can I tell you, we don't go by sight. We walk by faith. We're a people that walk. Abraham walked by faith. By faith, he looked for that city. It wasn't nowhere on this planet, but he continued to look for it because God promised him a home that was better than anything else. He was looking for that city that God had built. He didn't know where it was, but he kept looking for it all his life. He kept looking for that city. Isaac and Jacob continued to look for that city. They continued to sojourn and follow after God. Now, we have to remember that that promise is still to us today day that there is a better place there's a place that God is holding for us we see in John the 14th chapter in the second verse in my father's house are many mansions if it were not so I would have told you I go to prepare a place for you and if I go to prepare a place for you I will come again and receive you unto myself that where I am you may be also so we see here, we jump from the Old Testament where they're looking for a home. They're looking for a city whose builder and maker is God. And here Jesus is telling his disciples, hey guys, I got a place for you. I'm preparing a place for you and I'm going to go and make sure it's right. Can you imagine the, the place that God has prepared for us? Hayden, think about this. He created the heavens and the earth in six days. Rested on the seventh. For 2,000 years, he'd been preparing our place. 
making it just right. So that when I'm ready, when it's my time and God says, okay, I'm going to go pick him up. Jesus said, if I go away to prepare a place for you, certainly I'm coming back to get you. Why? He's coming back to get me so he can say, psych, you don't get nothing. (laughs) No, he's coming back to take us to our, our new home. He's coming to bring us to that place. I say it in funerals, it services all the time, and I believe with all of my heart. The person that passes from this world, they breathe out their last breath here and breathe in their first breath before God. I believe that. I believe to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord, and I believe that precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of His saints. If all those things are true, then i got to believe when I die, Jesus meets me there. In that moment and in that place, he's there and he's there to say, hey, Packy, I got a place for you. I've been prepared it just for you. It's got everything that I know you're going to love is in your place. Why don't you come and see it? I'm going to take you home. And the last time I'll ever have to go home will be in that moment because when I get home, then I'll never have to leave again. Amen. It's a home that we'll live eternally in. And that is the goal. That is the process. I'm looking for that city. Amen. I don't know about y'all, but I'm like Abraham. I'm just a pilgrim in this world. This world, it's not my home. I'm walking through this place and I'm looking for a city whose maker and builder is God. I'm not going to be satisfied with a made on earth uh, home. I'm not going to be satisfied with a made on earth life. I'm not going to be satisfied satisfied with with what the world says this is what I ought to have but I want a God built something amen I don't want to sat, be satisfied with with an earthly made relationship I, I want a God made relationship I want relationships that are going to last for eternity if people aren't saved you're not going to spend eternity with them I know we we've got this thing being going on where everybody gets to go to heaven and it doesn't matter how they live their life or what they look like when they died we all act like well everybody's going to be okay everybody's going to get to go to heaven that's not true true if we die without christ jesus we spend eternity in separation from god we have to die in faith looking for that city die believing that jesus is the only way the only hope that we have is to keep our eyes on jesus so that we get to where we need to be in heaven Y'all, there's not many ways or many paths. There's only one. And we have to keep our eyes on Jesus. We've got to keep looking for that city. I want want the things in my life to be eternally built. And the only things that are eternal are things that are God-built. The things that God puts inside. The things that God raises up. Each of us that are saved, the Spirit of His Son is coming to our heart crying, Abba, Father. And we become eternal saved beings when Jesus changes and we begin to unfold the DNA of Christ Jesus begins to grow inside of the children of God. And and we begin to see something outside of ourselves. We begin to believe something that is only achieved through faith that I can't see it and and I can't prove it, but, but I believe it with everything inside of me. And Jesus promised the disciples, I'm going away, but I'm coming back. I'm going away so I can prepare for you, and I'm going to send the Holy Spirit. And He's going to make things okay for you. But you got to remember that because I'm going away, I'm coming back. And because I'm coming back, you hold on to that. See, Abraham had that same promise. Because he was looking for a city whose builder and maker was God. He was looking for a permanent home that he would be able to move into. And he wasn't able to move into that until after Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection. But after Jesus was raised before the throne of God and his blood covered the judgment seat, turned it into the mercy seat, then he led captivity free, led all of paradise into heaven, and they entered into the, to the home that God had prepared for his saints. And so we see that that city whose builder and maker is God is is, is mentioned not just in the Old Testament for Abraham looking for it, but here again we we see Jesus talking about it. And then I see in Revelations 21.1, 
And I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth were passed away, and there was no more sea. And I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of the heavens, prepared as a bride and adorned for her husband. Oh, there it is right there. That, that is the city that Abraham looked for. Amen. Isaac and Jacob, they walked all over planet Earth looking for that city whose builder and maker was God. The problem was that city was not on planet Earth at the time because it was in heaven being constructed and put together. It was in heaven with God. And that's where Jesus said He was going away to, but was coming back so that we could have that place prepared for us. And after the rapture, after the church, after the millennial reign of Christ, and after the final judgment, He creates a new heaven and a new earth. He's going to set that new city. The city that all of His people have been searching for. The city that everybody on planet earth who loves God has been looking for. That city that is eternal. That place where I will never again have to be moved. That place. It's going to come down in the new Jerusalem. That new Jerusalem is right now in heaven. When we leave this world before the, the end of all that is and God takes us home to be in heaven, we enter into that new city. It's not something that we can't enter into. He is finishing all the places that need to be finished first. He knows when you're going to come. He'll put the last little piece in the last little place. When you breathe your last little breath. And he'll bring you right into your place. He'll say, I got it ready for you. Won't be like my wife was. I got one more thing to buy, baby. One more thing to buy, baby. One more thing to buy. I tell you, she has one more thing to buy me. She told me now, I said, everything's bald for now. Isn't it good if she leaves herself that opening? But when we get to heaven, it'll all be done. No surprises. I look at that and I think about the fulfillment. You think about Abraham who in the Old Testament looked for this city. Now this wasn't written when Abraham was looking for a city, but God had already laid it out. He'd already showed him. See, this is how I know the validity of what Abraham was looking for was a real place. He wasn't looking for some fantasy uh, island looking place that could be there, could not be there, could be translated as oh, it was something else. It just was like that. So you know God is preparing a place. Do you understand that tonight? Do you understand that God's preparing a place for you? God did prepare a place for people he don't plan on having come home. Amen. He is the Father of us all and He's waiting on those of us that will call upon His name. He's waiting on us to give Him everything that we have and to follow Him into all the things that, that He wants us to do. But I want you to understand that there's a process that we as Christians have to walk through. You're going to go through tribulations. You need to understand that. Don't be shocked when things don't go your way. When all of a sudden everything around you looks like it's going to fall apart, don't panic, throw your hands up and scream running into the darkness. Raise your hands and glorify the God that called you because faithful is He who called you. God's faithful. He's not going to let you fall to nothing. But you know what? When you come through the fire... You're going to find things on the other side you didn't know you had. God's going to show you things on the other side that He added to you. There, there is something about the holy fire of God that burns away the junk and only leaves the good stuff. That's what God's trying to do. So many of us are full of fluff. We are, and God got to get rid of it. He said, it ain't going to last the fire. We need to get rid of that stuff. He said, I'm building a church that's going to last forever. I'm building a church that's going to go through everything. We've got to get rid of all that fluff. All that, I'm going to play church. All that, I'm going to serve God as long as the blessings flow. Let me tell you something. Serving God don't mean you're going to have all the blessings at one time every time. There are times we're going to walk through the fire and we're not going to know how God's going to get glory out of this, but God's going to get glory out of it somehow because I'm going to hold on and faithful is God. I know that God is capable of turning everything in my life around, but if I let go and won't allow him to bless me, I can't then blame him. I'm not being blessed. 
And too often the church turns loose. We lose focus. We give up on the divine dream and we begin to take the American dream. We begin to want to have money and success. We think, well, I'm a, I, I'm a human being and I deserve all these things. And if I can have all this stuff, it'll make me happy. The problem with that thinking is that there are people who have all the stuff you want who are not happy. There are people who got everything they thought would make them happy and they weren't happy. They're still looking and they begin to abandon the things that they hung on to because they think somehow if they do something else, maybe they'll get what they want. The problem is we can't get it outside of God. And if you step outside of God trying to get it, all you're going to do is fall on your face and lose everything. You cannot compromise to gain Christ. Now, now Paul, Paul was a very powerful apostle, but Paul was human like us. You know, how many of Paul made some mistakes? He admits to them. He got mad and wouldn't let John Mark go with him. Matter of fact, got so mad, wouldn't let Barnabas go with him. Barnabas is the one who got him from Tarsus. He said, well, I mean, I mean that's really, he upset, he mad. He's not showing love of Christ. But later on, he says, send John Mark to me. I find he is profitable to the ministry. In other words, I was wrong about him. I think that's powerful. We know that, that he wrote, you know, I, I know that God wrote this and told him to write it down because if he hadn't, if he wouldn't have wrote it, that I prayed three times for God to take this from me. And God said, no, <laughs> I don't want you to be exalted above measure. You got too much pride in you, son. That's what he said. He said, you're too prideful. I can't do that for you. Because if I do this for you, you're going to get pride cause you to stumble. And then Paul says in another place, I'm so careful in my choices, at least after I've led so many others to Christ, I myself become a castaway. You, know, you got to be aware of the, the ability to fall away. Because so many people think it's okay to compromise and stay close enough to jump over to Christ in that last moment. Right before I die, I'm going to pray a prayer. The Bible says that godly sorrow works repentance. A planned abandoning of sin to jump into heaven so you miss hell is not godly sorrow. That's a poor man's plan. Because the longer you walk the fence, the long, further you'll find the fence goes from where God is. You'll straddle that fence right into hell. Because it doesn't end up in heaven. You fall off on the other side of it, you're still in hell side. you got to get off that fence and start walking after God. Remember the moment you begin to ask, how far can I go before I've gone too far is the moment you've gone too far. The moment you begin to plot and plan to find ways around what God wants to get what you want and still have God, you've gone too far. You're no longer looking for that city who has a builder that is, is God. Now you're looking for a city that man has built. Built on compromise and lies and half-truths. That's what the world builds. They build religions that won't hold water. When the floods come in, they come right through and destroy everything. Because man-made religion depends on man to fulfill them. Man-made religions demand that we sacrifice our stuff to that God so that we can have something good, whereas our God-made religion has Jesus giving everything to give us hope. Jesus came and died for us. He didn't ask us to die for Him. Every other false religion in the world demands that we take a life or give something, some life in, in replacement so that that God can take care of us, but not our God. Our God said, no, I'll come die for you because the only hope you have is me giving everything for you because there's nothing you have I need. All I want is to love you and you love me back. I'm not going to be made better by you. I'm going to make you better by me. Paul says, I, I don't want you to misunderstand He's talking about heaven. He's talking about the power of God. He's talking about knowing Him and the power of His resurrection and the fellowship of His suffering. He says, brethren, I count not myself in Philippians 3.13. I, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forward into the things which are before, I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. He said, I'm forgetting about all that other stuff. 
There's a lot of stuff I could bring up. Come on, James. There's a lot of stuff you could say about other people. Oh, you know, Pastor, that rascal ain't no good. Let me tell you what they did. Now, all of us, when we got folks in our life, we can say, you know, the, uh, 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 these people did this and, and they did that. And I want to be what God wants me to be, but I got to get even first. Those people got to know what they did is wrong. It would be mercy if you told them and they straightened out. But they won't. They're going to stand before God and have their, their sins revealed to them. And in that moment, it'll be too late. I'm not going to let them drag me to hell with them. How many of y'all understand that people can't make you go to hell? Only you can make that choice. God didn't send anybody there. When people say, I can't believe God would send me to hell, he didn't. You sent yourself there. The Bible says the wages of sin is death. What is a wage? A wage is what you get paid. You earn that. I can see Brother James now. He, the, the, the company calls, hey, your check's ready. He shows up, and they give him a check with 30 less hours, and he worked. Oh, no, I don't think so. Oh, no. And if he don't do it, Miss Cheryl will be doing it. She says, you get back up to get my money. We, we, no, no, no. We earn that money. Uh, well, you work for that. We earn that. How many people have earned their way right into the pit of hell? They have lied, cheated, and stolen. They have done everything the Bible said not to do. They did it. And don't you think for a minute God's going to rob you. God's not a thief. He ain't going to rob you. You've earned it. You're going to get it. Oh, but there's a gift. There is a gift you can't earn. There's a gift that comes from the throne of an almighty God, and that gift is life. But you've got to accept that gift. And you've got to reject everything else, and you've got to stop looking for earthly treasures. You've got to begin to look for a city whose builder maker is God. You've got to begin to make a choice that, that you're going to focus yourself on God and, and not be distracted by people, not be distracted by politics, not going to be distracted by, by, the, by the foolishness that's going on around me, but I'm going to focus on what God called me to do. How many of y'all know that there are so many things that can draw your attention away from God if you just let it? It's a matter of making a choice. I'm going to set my face to God. And I'm not going to be turned away. I made it a, a, a matter of principle with me that I refuse to allow somebody else to cause me to stumble. I'm not going to let somebody else steal my peace. I'm not going to let somebody else take away my joy, my hope of, of my eternal. I'm not going to allow the devil to come in and worm his way into my heart and cause me to doubt God. And the only way he can do that is if I let him. If I focus on the garbage in this world, it'll rob me of my victory with Christ. Every time, y'all, I've got to focus on the prize. What is the prize? The prize is heaven. That is the mark of the high calling. The prize that he's talking about here is, is heaven. It's Jesus. It's being reunited. Janet, you can come. It's being drawn back together. There's a community in heaven from here. There's family members in heaven from here. There are people who have died in faith who are in heaven now that bring a joy to us, a strength that we think about. Amanda posted a, a picture of Laura Jean. It was my brother Eddie's wife married to him. For almost 20 years they were married. And she was the best of people. I posted on her thing that they were probably celebrating her birthday in heaven and she was getting Eddie a second piece of cake. Because she waited on him hand and foot. Joe, I used to tell her when she was getting ready, I said, don't marry Eddie Large and you're too good for him. Eddie said, you leave her alone, let her make a mistake. She was such a sweetheart. And I know that she's in heaven. She suffered a lot, a lot in this world. But her suffering ended. I think about my dad, 58 years old. His faith became sight in that moment. He left this world 
I was there when he breathed, just about breathed his last breath on earth. And I know he breathed the next breath in heaven. I have been at the bedside of many a person here in Homa. I've never really been around people as they were dying until I got here as pastor. And I sat there with many and prayed them and they took their last breath and left this world. And, and, and I'm going to tell you, for the Christian, that last moment, there's peace. When the, when the flesh stops fighting, there's a peace. The approach to death it's not like the world. They cry out, give me, I need another year. I need a little bit more time. Certainly dying is not easy. But when you have your eyes on the other side, when you're looking out across that, that Jordan River into the promised land, and you know beyond a shadow of a doubt that there's a God waiting on you, you know that you have a future, that this is not the end of who you are, but the promise of your faith is about to be answered. There's a peace. There's a strength that gives courage to say to people, yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. It's in those moments that we have to cling to the cross of Christ. We've got to stop abandoning God in the darkness. You, know, you can't see in the dark. Where are you going? Where are you going to run to in the darkness? You run off in the dark, what happens? You hit something. When I was probably middle school age, we, we had come down here to Homa, and my Uncle Tommy and my Aunt Lou had a camp out, uh, I think down Chauvin, I believe it was. It was, it was out. It was a big house. It wasn't a little camp. It was a big house. And I... Uh, Eddie, my brother, my cousin Tommy, and I were all staying in the same room, and they said, get up and turn the lights out, because I was the youngest, so naturally, that would have been my job, to get out of bed, so they didn't have to. And so I run over there, and I flipped the light switch off, and I took off running in the dark and dove back into bed. They heard a thump, and me go, ah, they both of them told me, be quiet, you're going to get us in trouble. Well, I got up and I was not quiet. I went and flipped the light switch back on and there was a steady stream of blood coming from my head. I dove, missed the bed, hit the cabinet behind it. One of the little straight edge cabinets <laughs> slit me open, blood everywhere. They said, why did you hit that cabinet? I said, I didn't see it. It was dark. When you run and jump in the dark, you hit stuff. And you're walking through the valley of the shadow of death. Don't run, it's dark. Don't, don't allow fear to cause you to hurt yourself, but instead hold on. It's in those moments that God will show you He is God. It's in the dark moments that you don't know what you're going to do. You hold on. And you find out how faithful your God really is. I know our instinct is to let go and run. <laughs> I don't see, I can't see, I'm getting out of here because I can't see nothing. Y'all, that's where my faith has to step in. Abraham walked around in this old world not knowing exactly what he was going to have. But he said, I'm going to find that city. I guess he must have saw it somehow in the spirit. Because he kept looking for it all his life. You know, I've not, I've never seen Jesus with my natural eyes. But I'm searching for him. I keep, I keep going for him. I, I feel him at times. And I'm drawn into deeper places. It is those moments a minute ago when she was singing. I just, I just felt God. I just wanted to stay there just a little longer. I just wanted to be in His presence a little longer. Because there's some of those moments when I don't feel it. And I hold on to these moments. That's what gets me through the darkness is these moments. That's what I hold on to in the struggle, these moments. 
And I'm looking for that. I'm looking for that same city that Abraham did. Would you bow your heads, please, and close your eyes. If our prayer team would come, we're going to get ready to pray. But if you're here, you say, Pastor, I am going through some things, and I just need God to help me. Would you slip your hand up? I see the hands. I, I'm headed to heaven, but I've taken my eyes off Jesus just ever so slightly. All of the bumps and all of the noises have kind of distracted me, but I'm ready to refocus my life back to God. Is there anybody here who would say, yes, Pastor, that's me. I see the hands. Thank you. Would you stand to your feet all across the building? Father, you saw the hands and you know the heart. I ask that, Lord God, as we stand before you, that, Lord God, we're going to put our eyes on you, Jesus, and we're going to look for that city. Father, give us the courage and the strength in Jesus' name. If you need prayer, you come, and we're going to pray for you. Nothing else. Nothing else.